Hello and welcome to Too Fast, Too Forever. There's all kinds of family. We chose this one. This is episode 349, Fast and Furious, Lap 14. I'm Joey Lewandowski. I'm Joe Two. And this episode's brought to you by Alan Wake 2, Monsters Wear Many Faces. Alan Wake 2 is out now on PC, PlayStation 5, and Xbox Series X. Shout out to Alan Wake 2. Well, shout out to Alan Wake 2, and welcome to Too Fast, Too Forever. Before I introduce our guest, Joe, this is the weirdest coincidence thing we've ever had on the show. This movie we're talking about tonight came out 15 years ago today, on the day we were recording. Oh, I April didn't know 3rd, that. April 3rd, 2009, 15 years ago. April release for a Fast and Furious movie feels weird. A lot of them are. A lot of them are. I mean, they, they, I think that's the... It's like Fury May. It always was. feels like May. Furious 7 was, I think. Hmm. Who knows? Okay. Okay. April 3rd is early in the F9 movie season, was though. supposed to. April 3rd is early. You are correct about that. But with us tonight, once again, all lab long, we have with us tonight... Kim Basine and Walt Hickey. Hello, gentlemen. Welcome back to the show. How's it going? What's up? How are you two doing tonight? Delighted. This is great. This was this was a breath of fresh air. This this was a terrific film. And uh, and yeah, no, we're we're hitting we're hitting a stride. You know. Good. We are also talking tonight about Los Bandoleros. So remind us, remind our listeners, how many times have you seen Fast and Furious 2009 a lot? Once, a handful of times, and I think the answer is no, but had either of you seen Lo Bandalero before tonight, or today, or this week, or whenever? I have seen The Fast and the Furious, or rather Fast and Furious. Thank you. Uh, approximately, probably I would say this is comfortably my fourth time. Okay. Maybe, okay. maybe on cable in the background a couple times, but like comfortably I've seen this film, this is my fourth view. Wait, do these movies play on cable? I've never noticed before. <laughs> Are they always on TNT? <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like it's only been a, a handful of times for me. This is definitely the one that I've seen the fewest number of times. Okay. And had either of you seen the short film written and directed by Mr. Vin Diesel before? Did not know this film existed. Nope. So <laughs> so let's start there. What did you guys think of the 20-minute Los Bondoleros? Interesting choices were made by both director and actor Vin Diesel. Oh, Inter- okay. Okay. Interesting choices. Good, interesting, or bad, interesting? Yeah, I would say that this this film is interesting uh, because it, it is very much like like a tone poem. Like it, it does, like stuff doesn't really happen a ton in there, and that's nope. okay. It reminds mm-hmm. you of some things, that, some dudes that occurred. Uh, it it like has you know people having macho conversations in bars with one another. I I would like to hear from you guys how this thing happened because I have theories, but I like I need to know why did why did Vin Diesel get to direct a twenty minute short film ahead of the release of the blockbuster motion picture directed by Justin Lin, uh, Fast and Furious. So I don't remember, we, we looked at this up when we watched it for the first time. I think the thinking was Tokyo Drift, so we we're covering Tokyo Drift later in the lab. Tokyo Drift comes out, Han dies. They're marketing Fast and Furious Han back. And people are like, wait, hold on, what? And so I think this was made to kind of link the two, because Fast, Fast and Furious does not, the full film does not ever established it is a prequel you just have to use your brain to be like i guess this happened before um so this was i think showing how han knew or like why han is there in the beginning of this movie and sort of connective tissue or canonical glue from where we were to where we're going also vin the auteur obviously had this thought in his head you know gasoline is life if we're not moving we're dying Mm -hmm. So I think that he just needed a creative outlet to get this out. Now, what makes no sense is this did not release until the Blu-ray release of Fast and Furious number four. So even though this is a prequel to the movie that we are talking about tonight. That is a prequel. That they are talking about the heist. The thing, the heist they're talking about in in Los Bandoleros is the heist that they do at the beginning of this movie. No one saw it until after they saw the movie, which is wild. This makes sense to me because I don't think I've ever seen any piece of media so contractually obligated as part mm. of the terms of developing the Riddick franchise as this particular short. This really screams like, you know, he did want to get his shot at directing and probably writing the Fast and Furious. And they were like, 
I don't know about that one. I think that we can we'll give you a 20 minute this budget that kind of stuff. Stamp your name on the franchise. See how we go. Because Kim, you you had I think a slightly different reaction to this film. No, no, I I, I have a thought. I, th- I think the tone here might be overly negative. No, so, no, of course. So, yeah. Let's bring it back up. Something about the it is it is extremely atmospheric. Right. So that. It, fe- it feels I mean, perhaps in a movie like say dune that could have been accomplished with like literally one shot and you're like oh, okay i understand where i am yeah uh in, in vin's case you decided to take 20 minutes to show yeah. us what- mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah but but you know the, the first uh the first 10 minutes or so where they're just kind of you know looks you, you see these little vignettes of of life in this place like that was that was yeah. kind of cool it was cool yeah, there's like there's like eight minutes before we see anybody that we recognize basically right like it just or at least until vin shows up I think that genuinely Michelle Rodriguez might have more screen time in this film than she has in Fast and Furious. Well, we <laughs> we have often this might referred be to this as the best Letty. Like, this is the most she's ever given to do. This ah! is the most agency she, she ever has. This is also, we will get to way later in Furious 7. We don't see it here, but this is when they get married. Like, this is like, this is their honeymoon an off screen, like that's like there's just so much that could have been on the screen. It, that it was gets not on the screen. onto the screen eventually. <laughs> okay. Anyway, this, this watching Los Bandoleros this time made me really wonder what the fuck these movies would have been if they would have let Vin write, direct, and act. Right. Hold, hold on, right? Like, this is Vin's thing. It let him do every single bit. Of like everything. we, we, he might actually have believed that. Fast and Furious movies should be up for Oscars. If this mm-hmm. is what he made, you know, in tw- for like twenty minutes, if you if you gave him two hundred fifty million dollars in two hours, he would be like, "I can make He's an like, Oscar." Give movie. me double the money and double the time. Yeah, but, yeah first, yeah. Would Would you like to see more of these? Because I, I, I sure would. Yeah, like that. Uh, <laughs> in the same vein as like you know how Disney releases shorts, not not yes. the individual short, but the right. franchise linked. Shorts. Yes. Yeah, so it's the Marvel like, one shots you know, and stuff. Yeah. It's like <laughs> Olaf's Winter Wonderland. Like that. that that's oh. can, can we get that with a different fact? You want like every, just... every, every movie, he should get <laughs> one 20 minute vignette beforehand. And it's just like tonally way different. You just got to get like Peacock on the phone because they might do it. <laughs> Keep in mind, you're asking two guys whose idea it was to watch these movies over and over again forever. Do you want more of these? The answer is yes. yes we want always more yes. Or. I think there's something very fun about just being like a 20 minute thing that like kind of ties into the movie, but not, I mean, it directly does, but also it's completely unnecessary. It's very vibey. I have a question. So we we're watching this and Han says something and I need your brain, Joey, to help me un untangle the, the time web that we're in. No. Han says he's never been East of the Atlantic in this movie. Is that, is that, canonically true east of the atlantic because we're we're to assume that this no, is no 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 what? no because if better luck tomorrow is truly a prequel he went to high school in california wait no wait hold on he said he's east, never been east he's never east gone the that atlantic. way yeah you're of africa asia right yeah yeah so yeah so we know that he grew up in california went yes. to high school he then goes down to the dominican republic i guess flies in from california and then at the beginning of Fast and Furious, he says they're doing some crazy stuff in Tokyo. Yes. Goes over there and then comes back for Fast Five. So, yeah. Canonically, it holds up. It holds water. Interesting. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't, rem- like, because this this is firmly, like, the this should be the first time we ever see Han ourselves, correct? Um, As fans. Yes. Correct. Okay. So then, then it does the make sense. In timeline order. Well, in timeline <laughs> order, it would be... Oh boy! It would be that's Better what I'm Luck to tomorrow. Say. Los Bandoleros, Fast and Furious, Fast Five, Fast and Furious Six. Before the end credit scene. Mm-hmm. Tokyo Drift. Tokyo Drift, and then also the scenes from F9 and Fast Ten and whatever they flash back. Okay, that's what I thought. Totally normal. That makes totally sense. Totally easy to yeah. track. <laughs> Um, I don't know if either of you guys know, there is a low-budget, I think, straight-to-DVD movie from, like, 1997 or 1998 called RPM, which is not good. We watched it as a patron and was like, you guys need to see this piece of shit. Um, <laughs> but in that movie, that movie is about these guys have invented a car that does not use gasoline. Uh-huh. And this oil tycoon's like, we got to destroy that car because I'm going to lose all my money if this is true. And in this Los Bondoleros, which is the first time we've seen it since we saw RPM, they're like, there was a gas, there was a car that didn't take gas, but they took it away. It's just like, yeah, same thing, right? There's always like it's this. It's RPM, yeah. It's RPM. RPM is canonically a vast <laughs> property, I guess. 
I'll that movie's you. really wild if you guys get a minute. It's really fun. It's, I think it's it, on it, YouTube. It feels like a Fast and the Furious movie and then also absolutely does not at the same time. They also use uh, engine grease as lubricant for sexual intercourse. Oh! I don't know about that one, boys. I think <laughs> they're clothed. They're clothed they, during they, it. Politics about like gasoline for a film in 2009. Mm-hmm. I, like 2009, we know that something's up. Like, mm-hmm. it's not like it's a mystery of, of, of the link between uh, gasoline. And, like, Vin, Vin, Vin is very much just, like, we got, like, gasoline is life. It's just that we can't have anything with that. It's just, like, it's like I don't know, man. I get what you're going for there, but the metaphor feels a little bit dated. <laughs> like, yeah. You're not wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're not wrong. Also, it's, like, very much, like, can you see through my veil? And it's, like, yes. Yeah, it's right there. Yeah. we can definitely We can definitely guess what you're trying to tell us here. Yeah. I will say I'm very excited to break this this down minute by minute. We're going to do all of Tokyo Drift first, which is going to take us years, and then we're going to do this, but we're getting there, and I'm excited to do this one, because I, I don't really know this one nearly as well as I know the oh, other not stuff, a, so just like, No, not at all. Same. Yeah. Yeah. Do either of you have any more thoughts about Los Bondoleros before we pivot over toward Fast and Furious? No. <laughs> yeah. Do you? <laughs> I do not. No, I do not. I do not. Are you glad you saw it? Yeah. I suppose. Okay. It's fun. It's, it's, like, all that, it's, it's all that matters. Like again, like as like a Star Wars fan, there's a lot of stuff that happens in Star Wars that's just like, I didn't. This did not need to be in a movie. I'm glad it was in a comic book. I enjoyed the comic book. I don't think I'm going to read it again too much, but I'm glad I learned what that was. And, and like, so I think that that was this kind of moment. Makes sense. Fair. Yeah. Well, then let's dive into Fast and Furious number four, which again was released on this day, April third, two thousand nine. And right away, one of my most 80s moment is Han's got this beautiful feathered hair in this opening sequence. Oh. I'm just like, that's pretty 80s. Like, there's, I don't think there's a ton about this movie that is very 80s, but like very early on, I'm like, that hair belongs in the 80s in, a, in, in the most beautiful, perfect way. I wrote down Han looks particularly sexy. Mm. So, yes, absolutely. <laughs> 80s really, really hit. Did you guys have 80s picks? My 80s pick is um extremely volatile uh, camera filters based on oh. whether you are in Mexico or are mm-hmm. in the cop room. Because in the cop room it feels like it's very it's almost like shot with like a television camera, uh where it feels like in Mexico they really just do the like, oh, total sepia filter, nothing yep. they can do about it. Like yeah, <laughs> it, like it just felt very much like it's the only like it, there are is a distinct visual language of film, and I think that this film does perhaps rely on some of the more uh, prosaic versions of that. But yeah, that's definitely the eighties stuff. I got one. It's, What's uh, yours, bud? What you looking at, nutsack? Ha! <laughs> it's, oh, that's that's partially part of mine. That's that's a great one. One of my biggest ones was just Dwight as a character. Mm. His his like zebra print couch in his apartment, his cowboy outfit. What? Yeah, the nutsack quote, obviously. Dwight, I, I, I know that we'll get to Dwight eventually, but I feel like Dwight is the only character that I watched his entire arc happen on screen, and I was like, yeah, that guy voted for Trump. Like, <laughs> a lot of these, there's always like other like parts of their character that are just like, well, I don't know. It's because he's it, it, but, like the, the machismo could be, but it's just like, oh no, yeah, yeah, Dwight, yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> like, yeah, t- t- Dwight definitely likes Q and on. Yes, D- Dwight is the most into Q and on of anyone that I've ever seen on screen. <laughs> anyway, I'm glad that you brought up Dwight. <laughs> I really, I just, it's just, it, it's always amazing to me. That there is someone in this franchise who canonically who canonically is a foot guy. Like it's just that there's so much. He's also got a beautiful Xbox 360 in that room that I was noticing oh, this yeah. time. Like his mm. apartment is wild, and I don't I don't understand it. I don't know if it's there to be funny. I guess it is, but Dwight he's is very quite bad. special. With the deep state, they did set him up with that meth. I don't know. He's like, right. Yeah. I'm just saying, like, I think he's a fascinating character. I'm actually shocked that we haven't seen more of him. He's a great bit, though. <laughs> I really like Dwight. He, he's like a voice actor on some, like, cartoons or something, right, Joey? Didn't we find that out? He did, like, voice acting on cartoons. Oh, I like, think What so. else is he in? It, w- it was just, like, some random-ass, like, Ninja Turtles voice acting or something. Oh, yeah. I think he's a big Turtles guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you just think Dwight is your 80s Th- pick? That, or- I mean, now that, yeah, now that Kim said that, yes, but, um... I had two other more lower ones. One, the Buick Grand National that Dom drives in the beginning is like such an 80s car with it just being so like flat and boxy. And for some reason, 
the compost is Braga is hired a guy that to play compost mm-hmm. to play Braga when compost is Braga mm-hmm. storytelling trope feels very 80s I don't know if that is is actually 80s but the whole that whole cycle of the like heel turn is the heel is the heel turn but then there's also an actor playing him for some reason that felt 80s to me too my pick not just the hair the hair i think is up there dom getting a call on a payphone mm. in mexico is a big one or dominican republic wherever he is in when he you know when Letty, he finds out letty's been murdered but in the street race i don't know if i've heard we probably have talked about it but one of the racers calls somebody ghetto smurf which is a shout out to gone in 60 yes but that racer calls back to the other guy he calls him chia pet and like chia pet i don't know if that's 90s or oh, 80s but that's definitely it feels 80s i think yeah so i was like the name chia pet referencing a thing maybe talking about hair i guess but chia pet just the vibe of chia pet feels that's good that's a that's good a pull. 80s very good one i like that excellent they did for 2009 certainly yeah so walt take it away what do you want to talk about the thing that you loved hated forgot about were surprised by overall did you like this movie where's it st- i mean don't yeah. give us your rankings but compared to where it's a different kind of movie than the first two what do you think of fast and furious this time around Here, so i'll tell you there's a vibe shift that happened that like i've never thought about before i saw this movie that i think makes a lot of sense we're getting to the part where they go from being thieves to people who do to spies basically mm-hmm. In mm-hmm. and so like, I think a thing that's really interesting is that, like, I write about this in, in, in my book a little bit, and it's just, like, the heist movies are awesome because heist movies require uh, directors to do something that is directly counter to human nature, which is, like, the first thing that we learn as children is, like, don't steal, share, be nice to prove mm-hmm. stuff. Yep. Like, respect to property is a very early and, I would argue, fairly universal value. If there's nothing fundamentally American, Western, anything like that, don't steal other people's shit is an important thing. And so for when you do a heist movie, you, your challenge is how do you make it so that you're understood to be the good guy? So you have to – heist movies are all about – it's a reflection of society, that something is wrong in the structure of society. And the only way to subvert that is through a heist, right? And so we'll get to a lot of this more, I think – next time that we chat but like i've i've always kind of understood like there's a difference between like an action movie and like in a, and like a heist movie where they're thieves what this movie does is it like i think it does something really interesting where it, it i thought when i was watching it that there's such a huge difference between following a movie about a person who's currently a criminal versus following a movie where somebody's a fugitive and movies mm. with the fugitive is such a more interesting vibe because then like, you know, they did some things bad, perhaps. Yeah, but that's in their past. They're just a guy trying to get by and the heat's on them and they can't stay too long. And they're... and like fugitives, I think, are far more interesting characters than criminals and arguably even like reformed criminals and arguably absolutely cops. Because fugitives, there's always like a baseline level of temperature in every single scene, because this could be the scene where they get God in any yep. given movie. And so I, I don't know. I think I'm just like, there aren't a lot of movies about fugitives. I think I just like, I saw uh, the movie The Fugitive starring yeah. I like I saw it like on, uh, on on cable recently, like when I was just in a bar or something. And like, I was like, man, that's a good movie. But like, I think I've like been turned on again to like, man, fugitives are really good characters because and this is like the fugitive movie. Like this is the like, okay, Vin's on the run, man. Like he like he's sticking his neck out for this. He's getting his revenge and that kind of stuff. But he's like very close to the police and he's very close to the people who want to hurt him. And like at any moment he could get got. And obviously in this film, like they'd make the interesting choice of like, yeah, no, they get, they, he gets captured. But like I just like I love the energy that that brought to this movie that I think was lacking fundamentally in the earlier movies because those you're just trying to make sense of who this guy is. And then are also lacking in later movies where I think the threat from the government is a little bit less real, where it's more just like, okay, great. Yeah, you have an international spy occasionally on the radar. Cool. But like this movie, just like it was the movie that there felt like there was a genuine baseline threat at all times. And I think that that was a super delightful experience. And then compare that to Brian, who is just, I'm a cop again. Yeah. Which uh, we need to talk a little bit about that. Please. (laughs) What are your thoughts on Brian just being a cop again? 
don't know if that's how, like, who is he working for? Is that the FBI? Is the, the DOJ. FBI? It's DOJ? Yeah. yeah. Why would they hire him? That seems like a terrible idea. <laughs> like, well, like, so, so uh, let's, can we go through all the, like, what really bad things has Brian done? Uh, yes. So far. A lot. He lets, he lets his mark go. That's the yeah. first, mm-hmm. first thing. Uh, and the he second- also was, you know, canoodling with his Mark sister as well on the job. That could have been. I mean, that, that, there's, there's, I'm sure <laughs> there's worse things he could have done. In, yeah. In the uh, c- compared with his colleagues over there. Uh, okay. So, so then you get to the second film where he. Okay, it gets it gets worse. I suppose in the. I, I think it gets in a lot too worse. fast, too furious. But isn't everything in too fast excused because he is doing it for the cops? Stealing the money at the end, I mean. Well, he did steal the money in the like with with uh, with Mr. Tyrese Gibson. They had a yeah. good time. I don't know. I don't think it's they enough to, to get open a, a garage. He should be working for the FBI. I guess is where I'm saying. He like, got like a super promotion, right? Like this is crazy to think about. Like they're like, okay, like ultimate failing upwards. Yeah. Anyway, I, you, would, you would think like usually you'll uh, the the movie trope would be you'd put him in some secret organization kind of secret cops like we get secret cops later yeah uh, or like we're the cops they have nothing left to lose and like that kind of, but like it's just the FBI I don't know I, the, the thing that this movie made a really good decision of which is that like is it the movie where it's just like yeah like you pour a patrol we just got to get it past those schmucks and like and like. <laughs> In terms of like working through the different mechanisms of law enforcement that you can be like against, they do hit a good one where it's just like, yeah, we'll just get under border patrols uh, eyes. That's fine. Like the conceit is clever of just like, okay, well the GPS thing is is dynamic. I think it's I think it's a fun movie. I think it's interesting. Kim, what do you think of this movie overall? I feel like this movie is a little <laughs> uh, is a little bit like ahead of its time, not in terms of like innovation and storytelling, but in terms of uh, like, th- this was early for like a narco movie. Yeah. Uh, with drug smuggling over the border and, and all that stuff. I feel like that got really, really, really hot. There's so many series about this, like after 2015. Right. Um, and, and this is, you know, it, it gets, it gets into, into that whole culture the, 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 the trafficking uh, tunnel stuff was again, like late 2010s kind of, uh, vibes, but of course, like I mean, this movie feels so much more serious than I think every single one yeah. of the other ones, right? And and yeah. by a lot, the thing that I didn't remember was the Phoenix's death is like it, it's possibly the most like visceral murder. Committed. Yeah, it's it's straight up like cold blooded revenge. Yeah, it, it, it's that. I mean, when when the Rock kills. Uh, when Hobbs does that at the end of uh, Fast Five, like it's still it's a bullet to the head. Like it, that's it. The, he he cold the cold blooded murder of car into other car to yeah. cut this man into is is <laughs> it's I mean it's different. It's different. It's not on tone for the rest of the the series. Usually it's just a bullet or an explosion or something, whatever it is. Well, I think it's that, and I think it, uh, this movie is typically one of the three consensus least liked movies in the franchise because i think people are just like it's it's kind of dark and mean and weird and like it doesn't it's not totally fun like the next movie or like you know lighthearted like the previous three movies like there is something that they are consciously doing differently here that people are like it, it gets them on the right path but this is a strange tone it's also they add a lot of stuff to it like so i was wondering when i was watching it like was there a contract dispute did she have to film Avatar? Like, why did they kill Letty that quickly and that weirdly and that off screen? I don't think she knew. Like, I, I on it, like as the actress, like I think that they were just like didn't bring her back. Yeah. Really? Yeah, That's because weird. because later, I mean, spoilies, but later, Michelle Rodriguez says that she didn't know that she was going to be in six until the post credit scene of five rolled while she was watching it in a theater. <laughs> oh God. So they just like hard launched her at the end of five. And then she was like, oh, guess I'm back. Yeah, like her displeasure with this franchise has been no secret throughout most of the franchise. Like she's like, I don't like that. They give me nothing to do. They just kill me off. They bring me back. I don't know what's going on. If they're not going to give me more to do, I'm going to leave these movies like it's not great. It did feel like they introduced Jordana Brewster to kind of do like a, a reset of girl protagonist of Fast and Furious. Yeah. Which I thought was interesting. I, so, how much do you guys know about the actual like history of how this movie got made and funded, like the original origin of this film? 
I we talked about it at one point, but I don't remember any of it now. Yeah. So originally, the the National Institutes of Health wanted to see what would happen if you had a relationship emerge with the least amount of chemistry. And so it originally started <laughs> as no, no, no. It just started as like Brian. And Mia Toretto. And then they decided, like, well, we need to kind of, we want to do a very large exposure to it. And so they said, well, we have to chain it to an existing franchise. Mm-hmm. And so they blew the dust off Fast and Furious. And obviously the rest is history. And then here we are. But they, it was actually just trying to figure out how the fuck um, you could bore somebody so much with a romance on screen if there's a baseline <laughs> level of interest. Turns out there's not. So yeah, it, it's kind of fun. A, a peek behind the curtain before I started recording, Walt's like, I took a lot of notes. I left those notes behind. And then when you said that, I'm like, this must have really stuck with you. If something pertained through the the notes you've left behind to like remember the funding and then i was just like oh you got me you got me yeah you don't you don't like the diner scene are you are you the bad guy pretending to be the good guy just not hitting at all we're gonna get there we're gonna get okay there. okay what what i think is funny about what while we're talking about brian is that this franchise all these movies like all of too fast has been watching it like they love to show our heroes like cut up and bruised up and like look what they've gone through Brian literally dives through a window to tackle a guy and doesn't have a scratch on him. I'm like, why do you not like give him like a cut cheek, or, like a cut forehead or something? But he dives through a window to tackle a guy off a fire escape to get the name David Park. And he shows up to work. And the only thing out of place is he's got like a loose tie. It's just like that. You dove through glass. Yeah, he did. He did level up, though. He like like the, the Brian. Brian has finally leveled up to the point where he can effectively parkour. And there's yeah, a okay. lot. He, there's a lot of parkour. Level Do, four. Dom's not there yet. He gets there. He's Fort a level four things. fighter. Famously, yeah. famously gets there uh, to that parkouring level. But but no, no. I mean, Brian's parkouring I, like crazy. Well, I think I think this is the time. What what is your most D and D moment? If 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 Kim's using the phrase "level up" over here, what is your most D and D moment for this movie? My most D and D moment is when uh, Brian rolls a successful insight check on the guy who is not, in fact, the bad guy. He's mm. just, okay, he's not even here. It's just like that's a classic situation where like you're playing D and D and you're like, "Hey, wait a minute, this doesn't seem totally right." I, I'm gonna roll insight check, and you get good enough where it's just like, "That's not him." It's just like, "Oh," but so that's the most D and D part. <laughs> The other D and D part is that this does feel like a D and D game that was like resurrected, where it's like, okay, we've had, like we did a side game where we went to you know Miami and, and we rolled a new character there, and clearly like, okay, everyone's schedules kind of align this time, so we're gonna get Dom back, we're gonna get Letty back, we're gonna get Brian here. Ted, he, he can't work today; he's he's working the late shift, and so we, he's gone home. It's also got the flavor of like somebody's just like, yeah, I actually want to roll a new character. I don't really like Letty. I think I like I have this idea for. A new like you know kind of a like a a cleric type like a healer her name's uh she's played by jordana brewster she's actually fuck she's the sister of yeah of of, of the main (laughs) i'm just gonna get rid of this character she you can just kill her off it's okay like i'm not gonna come back to her (laughs) very much like somebody wanted like did not want to commit hard to the character that they originally built but yeah very D D film just because of how slapdash and like disorganized and clearly just like availability based a lot of the decisions were made when it comes to who's in it so yeah for sure and then kim not to be outdone do you have a wrestling moment of the movie i do i mean there's a lot of turns in this movie right like truly but like i think at this point it's still in in too fast too furious uh, Brian is such a the like an obvious protagonist, right? He's the face. He's the, he's he's the good guy all the time. There's still that te- there's they bring back that tension in this in four uh, between him and Dom, and he's a cop, and he still doesn't like that he's a cop at, at the very beginning, and he slowly you know goes over. Uh, in wrestling, that's called a tweener. Someone that you still like, kind of like, but is doing a few bad things. Yeah, doing it's doing some bad things, but like some good things. And yeah. yeah. And so they're not like necessarily a, a face or a heel. You get a, a little tinge of that with Brian. But th- the one I was trying to follow throughout that whole movie is is Giselle. Mm. So she starts as a heel, but like kind of not really. Like she's nice to him the whole time. Ooh, and okay. It, it, it develops a, a decent amount through, through three or four scenes throughout the movie until he saves her life and then... Uh, and then she, what's the line? The line is, you saved my life. Now I'm willing to f- return the favor. And uh, that's her full face turn at the end. And then she one day joins the crew, right? So uh, that is, that's the big face turn that they really spent time developing. 
throughout the throughout the movie. And you know, I, I think they did it in a, in a way that they should do more in actual pro wrestling, mm. where it's very rare that like the good guy saves the bad guy, and the bad guy is like, oh, well, maybe I should change my ways. <laughs> That's a good point. They, I don't think that I don't ever remember that happening during the wrestling that I was watching. Yeah, no, it never I, goes I, that way. It's always like the good, like you know, he turns bad or the bad guys turn the good guy bad. Not yeah, that you exactly. like the, the other way. Indoctrinate the good guy, and then he's now he's now he's now he's bad. But yeah, no, I think they did a good job with that in this. I am enjoying how easy it is to find D and D, and I think you you wrestling moments within these different things because it really is just like it's the same exact kind of style of storytelling. Like you know, soaps have this like like it's yeah, sequential and building and improvisational almost in a way that no other franchise does this <laughs> like um and, and at least doesn't like choose to do this like this is just like the modus operandi of this entire franchise and i just like it a lot i think it's why it resonates so hard with like the like the common folk right like you have like all of the the structure of how we've been told these kinds of stories like if you can relate it to D and you can relate it to wrestling like you have the the building blocks already there that you're like, oh, yeah, this is somehow comforting, right? Yeah, they really can go anywhere, too, which is, I think, kind of always been the fun. Like, even before they went to space, people were like, oh, what's going to next? They go to space. And, like, it's just like, I think that there's a potential of just, like, this adventure-style storytelling that um, other folks kind of limit themselves to. You, We always knew there were only going to be three new Star Wars movies in that, in that like, three in the, in, in the new franchise right and so like it's, it's somewhat limiting in scope of what one can accomplish over the course of that whereas these just like really does feel like we've been talking about this a bunch like this is a weird moment for fast and furious these things could go on for another 20 movies they could end with the next like it's just like it's interesting i think what's also funny is that as you guys are noticing these things like you know drawing parallels to the things that you're passionate about when joe and i watch other movies we're like this is so fast and furious <laughs> just like you're like look at these things in the fast and furious we're like look at this fast and furious and these other things so I don't know that I ever knew that Stasiak's first name was Michael. I think that's 100% the first time they address him as Michael Stasiak. It's Michael Stasiak. I'm like, okay. I always forget that he shows up to their house, too, that he's, like, been at the Toretto's house. I always yeah, imagine him at, like, Quantico or something, right? Like, Yeah. Mm -hmm. He feels like also, that. Also, here's – okay, here's a um, – maybe we can talk more about Brian as a cop here. So Brian goes into, like, this holding cell of the DOJ and is like, we got to transfer, and then takes Mia and goes to a diner with her. <laughs> and then lets her leave <laughs> yeah yeah is Great that call. what <laughs> it's, he's, I a, guess he's, he's a terrible cop he's not a good cop he's, he's such not, a bad he, cop he just is, has never been a I good think, cop well, you think he, he was like a really good cop before won. and then the, the, the first movie like corrupted him to the point where he can never be a good cop again Wayne or, Johnson was a good cop when he gets introduced in the next one Brian yeah. has been a terrible cop we have that. We had that question. That was like a, a normal question we would ask people that would watch these movies with us. Like, is Brian a good cop or a bad cop? And yeah. then we're like, ooh, he's not even like a bad guy. He's just like terrible at his job. Like, right? He's okay. Being Thank a bad you. cop, letting guys go, make him a better cop than most cops or someone he's to root for. Broke a man out of jail. I don't know. I don't believe. Like, I think that he's his, his copness is kind of. We're done now with with the. This is that like the his like he'll, his like moment of like okay now I'm gonna leave this life and enter into this life of crime quote unquote is that at that last moment when he's leading the 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 jailbreak and then like I don't know I think that, that I love that that reflects the first scene in the film like the first scene in the film was them kind of doing their like carjack running that play yeah and it is I think it's a great set piece to be honest. I think the, it's one of the best in the whole series. I really, in my yeah. opinion, even like the Chuck iguana, was, the whole thing. Yeah. Like I love there, it. There's right? a shot where uh, the the truck's about to go downhill, and is, you know it's going to be the end. It's a third act of that particular uh, scene, and it zooms out, and you see the you see the the road go downhill uh, to eventually reach that turn, and I'm like, oh, oh, the stakes are. Yeah, here we go. It's about to happen. Yeah, and and like it, the it, how it harks back stylistically to the first the first film and and the like. It's it's great. When I was watching it this time, I kept feeling like uh, when he's like Letty, like here, grab my hand. I'm like, this is Justin Lin trying out the tank jump. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's very much like he's like dipping his toe in and or like that or he like when he gets to like the tank jump, he's like. What if we did that, but like put a lot of space in between it, and you're like, that would be kind of cool, right? And he's like, wait a minute, did I just say space? Let's book, let's save that for later. <laughs> yeah. 
exactly. Like, I just think it's a good special effect. It feels like a real special effect where, like, I don't think that it's the last real special effect that they do. Because I'm also not, like, a chauvinist when it comes to, like, oh, you only have to do real special effects, no CGI. But, like, most of the things in that scene felt like, oh, yeah, they blew up a tanker. Like, they they, they had to get a bunch of gas to do it. Like, yeah. it feels like, it, it, you know... It feels very much like the egg of what the rest of the franchise is going to be and like the starting point of what like if you had to like show these this franchise to somebody i think you could get away with just starting here in some ways there's another shot like very near the end when they're uh running for the border and it's very and there's in the desert and it's very mad max and all the cars are there mm-hmm. around them like you know it, it felt like a little bit just a tiny little bit like the uh when they're on the ice with the su- with the nuclear submarine, mm. yep. several movies from now with the, everyone chasing them like in this big open area, except with a lot fewer guns or smaller guns, I suppose, and no submarine this time. In the- Joe has made the comparison in past episodes about Justin Lin like having like a toy box of like things like you know in Tokyo Drift he's sort of but like this is when he actually has the real toys for the first time right like he has he makes Tokyo Drift but here's like all the real like the cool action figures like the name brand it's not the off brand Sean Boswell whatever but. It's, you know, it's figuring out how the pieces go together and what you can do with them. And it makes sense in a way that, like, if he knows he's going to make more of these movies, what can he get away with? What can he do well? What can his second unit guys do well? What can they believably make exciting and then really crank it up? In the next? It, it's also just crazy how big of a jump it is from this movie to the next movie. Yeah, it feels like it's an order of magnitude larger. I, again, this movie feels important for the same way that, like, australopithecus was important like it's not going to be the thing that takes over the world it's the necessary step in in between like the monkey and the human and like was that premeditated though i don't think so i think that he just goes like basically like this feels like he like surveyed the wreckage before him of three different films with three different protagonists essentially and was like what the fuck am I going to do with this? And like stitches it together in, in a somewhat cohesive way to see like, okay, does this work as like, uh, like it's not even a caper. It's almost like, like, but there is some element of that to it. I don't know. I, I think that like, I think that he starts just kind of throwing shit together and see what works. And it, I think it does start working. Right. I just think it's crazy to watch this movie and then be like, to ask people if they're leaving the theater would you believe me if I told you the next one in this franchise is going to be the best movie in the franchise? Like, to and watch this ne- one? And there's five more after that. It gives bananas. I, I do think, like, again, good. Fa- the thing that is, like, a little lacking is, like, I think, the, again, like, the comic relief element does necessarily make, like, the revenge stuff. Ah, is a little Dwight could have fixed everything. Dwight was important, but I also think that, again, like, in the next one, we do return two characters from the second film. And, like, it, it is a good film. It's, it's just definitely figuring out like what is going to be so magical very shortly you know you're absolutely right i don't think dwight is is a big enough stand-in for tej or roman and bringing them together like really i i think that that actually might now that i'm like now that we're talking through it that might be what is the giant tonal shift like not only is it darker but them just cutting both of like all at this point comic relief out of the film makes it feel really really like heavy and like there's gravity to it and if like because if you had tyrese in this this would be a completely different movie completely yeah right Uh, yeah i don't know i I, like i think that'd be a lot of fun Really, this is like the teardown before they build the, ma- the the magnificent thing that they want to. But it's good. I, I do dig like it, this is the first movie that actually kind of like and I think it's their only opportunity to so far. But like there is like a little bit of a like the relationship between like Brian and Dominic actually developing in, in a little bit. And like, you know, you have that like, you know, the classic wrestling moves like enemies become friends and things like that. And like this really does feel like the movie where they start clicking in a way. Even in the beginning, we were talking about like Brian is chasing some criminal down a hallway. There's the meme that's just like everything I see reminds me of him. And it's just like you're chasing down a bald guy in a like in- <laughs> wife beater who's got some sort of long necklace with religious iconography on it and like man you just every i just need that chase again you know and so you can tell that they're yearning for each other even if they don't say it and, and i just like that so i never made the connection that the guy that he's chasing to get uh what's his name brian clark's like, name like, kind of looks I like up, man i don't know <laughs> he kind of looks like vin diesel i never even thought about that yeah. wow everything i see reminds me of him i mean can you blame him 
especially with like action movies like that is like you know that's how people express feelings in these movies right like you know you don't like him crashing a car to kill a guy is like you know you could have a scene but like when the emotions get too high one must resort to blows right and, and like you know that's the like this is a format in a lot of different movies like the classic thing about like disney like musicals or just musicals in general is that like you know you talk until you feel so emotionally compelled that you must sing and then when you feel so emotionally compelled during the song then you dance and that kind of thing like that is with cars in this right like you 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 speak until you are so emotionally compelled that you must race and then once you once you are too emotionally compelled when you race that is when you fight and, and like that is <laughs> i think like what these these movies are built somewhat like that and it's very kind of fun to watch in watching this, I was trying to figure out exactly why this one feels like smaller than the others, in inclusive of like the first two, right? And there's the and it's so it's not. You think like, this feels smaller than the first two? Uh, yeah, I, here's okay. here's why. Uh, I think I think the stakes are higher, of course, in this one. But it, in the first two, because they're like in cities the whole yeah. time, and it all, you know, Miami has its own culture la has some cult they're in la just you know for in parts of this but like it happens in juarez half of this movie or they're just out in the country somewhere doing something like it, it, once we get to the 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 next few movies that happen in places like rio and then you do the whole you know world tour thing going through uh from abu dhabi to 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 Tokyo and wherever else like that's that you get such bigness from from like population and 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 people and and the the whatever the the, the culture is around there here you get a little bit in the Dominican Republic and then you get Juarez and, yeah and smatterings of LA and because we've already been in LA it's not like exciting and new right it's like we we were here for the first movie I, I also like they 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 do even shout out more fun cities than the one in which they're currently hanging out in, where it's just like, yeah, you know, Rio's supposed to be nice this time of year, and I don't even know if that was planned. Like, and like he's like, yeah, I'm gonna go check out Tokyo, and like they're like alluding to plot threads that eventually they will pick up, but at the very least, it, it's like a lot of the movie is just kind of spent in like dusty wilderness, and like the extras budget must have been an order of magnitude less for this one compared to the first two films, you know? Definitely, yeah, you're right. There is just like less 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 characters less extras for sure still pretty good i don't know i was i was I, thought, I was better than i thought it was gonna be yeah. again this time i think every time i watch it i'm like oh i guess it's not i guess it's not that bad a hundred percent kim i'm with you this was when we first started this i said to joey this is the movie i most dread rewatching every lap and it grows on you it really does i i think that we hold a special place for it because we know the gravity that it holds for the franchise like this works to build what we get to that we love and so like that has, plays a big part in it too yeah this feels like a necessary like reshuffling of the pieces to get to where we need to go it's it's pretty much a reboot in a lot of ways well like, like the the tagline for this movie literally is new model original parts so like hey we're basically redoing the first movie like we are coming back we have the, the, the four people you know kind of the four i mean one's gonna die don't 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 worry about that but like the three main people you know from the first movie are back and don't worry we're not gonna go to miami the we're one guy he to... liked mm -hmm. we added him to for a minute and we're just gonna see how this goes yep that's pretty good i don't that's a pretty good campaign i i think that that because again, like it really does feel like this franchise kind of lost its way, and now this this is it like finding its its core again, you know. Walt, do you have a parallel for this in any other like film series, or is this one of a kind? That is like one reason that I wanted to. Uh, we talked a little bit about this, but like, there's truly nothing like this. There's nothing like being built in the air quite as much as the Fast and Furious franchise is, it, except again, like you know, things that are very like adventure like you know wrestling soap operas things like that like they don't know what the plot's going to be in in you know six months they have some ideas but they're just going to see what the chemistry between these folks are add some people drop some people change some stuff up it's like genuinely just kind of a, a style of storytelling that like you know not even marvel does. like marvel has their stuff very figured out they're not really like figuring out chemistry along the way right um it, it's just it's very interesting to just kind of watch like you know there's clearly something that draws people to this these people and these characters and, and these stories and like there's just nobody else really doing it in the fly by the seat of your pants way that i think is as compelling as these guys are you know well there was we, we've mentioned before that we were watching icons on earth we finished the season on this franchise but it was either after like it might have been after this one but i think it was maybe after five where they were finally like 
oh, we should maybe start planning for where we're going and not just write these one at a time. Like, they're five movies in or even maybe six movies in. They're like, we should probably, like, plan for the future. It's like, yeah. How do you not know? Like, you're a franchise by now. <laughs> yeah. Like, th- this movie doesn't feel like... It, like, very much leaves it very open. I think that they kind of have a sense that they have something special here and they're going to get a fifth. But, like, I-, I don't know genuinely, like, how much they knew that they were going to get it. it. Like, the ending, I think, is, like... Could like if this was the last movie, that could be a good ending, right? Like it, it leaves yeah. open for what comes next. But I don't know. I just I, I really dug this in a way that it just there's truly nothing like this movie in other franchises, to my knowledge. Like I think Days of Future Past maybe kind of tried it, but like that was just you know that was far more corporate than this feels, you know. I think this movie also, so actually going back to what we started this episode talking about with Los Bondoleros, like this almost feels like it could have been or should have been its own 20 minute thing where it's like, this is how we get to, this is how we need to get to Fast Five with Dom captured and they need to break him out in a way, right? Like it could be like a 20 minute thing that then we get Fast Five. Yeah, they could have given him 30 minutes and we could have gotten to the end of that one and been like, he's captured and we see them pull up. But then also to see the end of this movie, like we talked about when we talked about Too Fast, where that movie just ends, they walk off, there's no credit scene, whatever. And then here you're like, oh, they're doing a thing. Like, I need to see the next movie. That's exciting. You, This was a provocative question <laughs> of like, is there anything else like this? And I think that the closest that I have, and I'll think on this more and I might watch more of these, more of the, film, the films that I'm going to refer to to see if I can cla- crack this. I think the closest thing is Godzilla. Godzilla is like canon, right? Of like, okay, here's the here's this timeline of Godzilla. Mm-hmm. Kind of hops all over the map. It's made up on the spot. They just wanted to like make some cool monster movies that obviously became very popular. But like the thing that always motivated the franchise is that everyone thinks that this is really cool. Like everyone thinks that what we're seeing on the screen is that's like a we're big, all really, like that's a big lizard. It's a really big lizard. It's destroying stuff. It's interesting to watch. It's got friends. It's got enemies. It's got friends that become enemies. It's got all sorts of, sorts of cool stuff. And like it's they're clearly flying by the seat of their pants. They're clearly trying to not like tell a great arc of a story that they have planned out when they you know first make the Godzilla movies or introduce Mothra. But clearly they're like oh yeah let's bring them back. They'll like that. Or like it's oh he's got a son now or oh we should kind of do a soft reboot but it's still Godzilla he's still gonna come from the ocean he's you know the story right it's not that important for this <laughs> but like it feels very Godzilla where like genuinely the kinetic energy that you see on the screen is gonna bring the people back regardless of what kind of scene setting you need to do around it. Here's a question I I've seen all the movies but I don't have the history I've only seen most of them once. It feels like this is also kind of James Bondy at least pre Daniel Craig where it's like. The next movie is going to be like the same guy, but like, you know, it's a different story and like, what, whatever. And then all of a sudden when Daniel Craig movies come out in the era of we are building a serious, somber franchise where like things have stakes. It's like, well, we need to connect the tissue. But like there was like, you know, 50 years or 40, 40, whatever years of James Bond movies are just like, I don't know, we'll figure out the next one when we write it. Like, I don't need to, it doesn't, whatever. Yeah. And like the thing that makes that similar is I think like there's a secret auteur of the James Bond movies and that's the Broccoli family. Like the the broccoli family controls James Bond, and like they get to pick the directors, they get sign off and everything, but they're the custodians of Bond the character. And I think much the same way that like kind of moving forward, Vin is kind of the custodian of the stuff. Like he does get he does get EP, he does get sign off. Like he's not directing the movies, he's hiring the directors in many different ways, and he's he's integral to the casting and all that. But like th- that's another franchise where you do have kind of like a steady creative hand on the till, even if they're not directly involved in the in every single element of it, you know. And that's mm-hmm. a good comparison. I like that. Yeah. But I also feel like James Bond, though, is a little bit like they feel like standalones. Like they're not like necessarily like arcs. Like Daniel and, Craig like, ones. Because except, they... Yeah, except those ones. Yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Like but pre-Daniel Craig, it feels like every one of these can be seen in a vacuum, which Fast and Furious can too, but they're not like ever building well, it for could the be next until one. the end of this movie. Like you go watch any of the first four and as your first one. Like we talked about that a lot, right? Like where can you what can be your first movie? These first four, like each kind of stand on their own. Mm. I think five might have been my first one. Five was my first one. I think I felt fine about that. Because mm-hmm. they do like, you know, you get all the, the the gist of what you need to know in it. It's after that, like once it like genuinely once it becomes more about like the most important F in this franchise, which is not fast and not furious, but family. Once it becomes more about that, then you kind of need to know some of the Kim, don't shake your head. You would have done it too. I would have if, if you have thought I'm it, just jealous of you, okay? you would have said that in a 
<laughs> well, there is a very weird line in this movie where, like, when Dom and Brian are fighting, when Dom calls Brian's cell phone from Letty's cell phone, Brian says to Dom, Letty was my friend, too. It's like, friend is the the wrong word here. Like, I know that, like, they have not really fully embraced the other F word, but, like, she and Dom were not friends. They were married. We don't know that, but they were married. And friend is not what it was. They'll get there. They'll get there. They'll get there. How long did they know each other? Just Brian and Letty. Just just the two of them. Minutes. Like, minutes. Because he, he think he he leaves and then he's in Miami. So like he knew Letty for like minutes, right? Well, I think I think she must reach out to him like we need to get Dom back in the Like that's what he, that's the point, right? Like she's like, I yeah. want to clear his name. And she the only cop she knows is Brian. But I I thought that the key part of their fight where he destroys Jordana Brewster's perfectly lovely cabinet full of very fragile things, just comically so. I thought that the impetus of that fight was like, oh, you were her handler or something, right? Like, yeah, see, yeah, because she called Brian. She's like, I want to clear Dom's name. I will go undercover to like, if I do, do whatever this, you can want, you clear his name. Yeah, and Brian now resoundingly resoundingly has tons of cop power because he's I love you. so much. He, he, he can he can get people off and bring in uh civilians to be undercover now he just has full range of whatever he wants to do so this is peak cop brian right it must, must be. be yeah yeah gotta be peak cop brian it's fairly this disgusting. is the highest form of policeman brian o'connor assumes yeah well he's never a cop again yeah. So, and this is. But he know. helps Hobbs like auxiliary. I guess like you know we can kind of say they're all kind of cops when they're working for Hobbs. Well, spies are different than cops, right? Okay, fair, fair. Yeah, um, spies. Spies is a good distinguisher. Also, Joe, like you know that. the difference between a cop and a criminal? Yeah. <laughs> One bad judgment call. <laughs> yeah. This movie does have some great one-liners. It really does. The movie's great. The difference between a cop and a criminal is that cops get to be exonerated after as many bad judgments as they want. <laughs> Kim, any other thoughts? Any other things you want to bring up? Any other things that you loved or hated or want to talk about with this movie? I don't know. I feel like I'm watching like something wriggle up on a beach. You know, like, oh, there's a fish. And it's like, you know what would be cool? Legs. And I'd like to get some legs. And it's real ugly and kind of gross. But man, that's gonna be a real good looking tetrapod in just one more movie, man. Like it's just, this is a liminal stage, and we got to get through it. But uh, yeah, it, it, it holds up. I think. That, I also. I think a lot of that's because of Justin Lin, and I think that 100%. he's a very capable director. I like his work, and I think that like this movie is really where I think it it um, it just kind of emerges that oh yeah, you do need kind of a creative t- hand on the till that isn't just you know a fan of Dungeons and Dragons like actually. <laughs> Uh, while the 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 tone of the movie overall was super serious, I think they really hit something on the music in this one. Like mm. we, we're gonna, it, the music just gets better and better from from this film. And I don't know how much of that has to do with you know act, the actual Don Omar song <laughs> starting. It's a uh, meandering its way into this franchise right now. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, no, it, it gets. I mean, c- compared to to. Two and three, I would say, and one. Oh yeah, all, all, all three of them. Like three, yeah. three. The soundtrack to Tokyo Drift is fire, though. I was gonna give the credit for the soundtracking to Justin Lin when you said that mm. because, because like I think that it makes that like you know one has, is like kind of classic based on what it is, but like when you hit three, that like that's when we start to get into the stride of like Justin Lin. Kind of feels like somebody that's with him or on his team, if not him is like, I got some ideas for some songs for this movie. And oh, like, yeah. Okay. He's like, okay. I wonder if you know how they how they live. <laughs> <laughs> Jody, you made a note any of your thoughts about this movie? No, I cut all mine in as we talked, brother. Well, then let us play this Ain't No 10 Second Race, a.k.a. Boy, Do We Have a Podcast for You. This is where we go on X.com, the X app, the everything app. It's Twitter.com, by the way. Well, yeah. Boy, do we have a podcast for you. Come and check out our show. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if they're ever going to set up that redirect. Probably not. I don't think they will. I also, like, it's really, really, really funny to me. And there's no, like, polite way to put it. But there's, it's very, very funny to me that they are trying to pretend that this is a video platform. As if, like, X video is not necessarily taken by an existing piece of a branding property. It, it just feels like... 
it, like so many things that are underbaked about this platform, it feels that I have I have one that I can kick it off. I have a I have a well, I hold have... on before before we kick it off, we need to review last episode. We gotta see if you guys have points. So we have last episode. I found dates and movies at dates and movies. April twelfth, in nineteen sixty eight, Argentine American drug lord Carter Verone was born in nineteen seventy three. Fast talking, fast driving Roman Pierce was born. Instead of fighting, they should have just shared birthday cake together. Hashtag too fast, too furious. I said. We've got to check FamousBirthdays.com to see who's more famous, but wow, what a day. Boy, do we have a podcast for you. It got one like from a sex bot, Sharon Hunter, at Sharon H. I'm not going to give myself points for that. Uh, Can't do it. Okay. Joe, you found Polisian Christique at Guidsman. Literalmente, Carter Verone did Too Fast, Too Furious. It was quote tweeting, the Ferrari president, John Elkin, arrives at somewhere looking like Carter Verone. We said... Please, somiglia proprio, proprio ragazzo, abbiamo un podcast per te. <laughs> he looks just like him, void of a podcast for you. No one, not even a sex bot like that one, Joe. I am so sorry. Mm. Oh, damn. Burnt Walt, again. Walt, you found Sky at Extreme Wisteria being laughed at, teased, made fun of for describing the artistry of Too Fast, Too Furious, and Tokyo Drift. And we said... Not only are you right, we could not agree with you anymore. You are heard in this world. Boy, do we have a podcast for you. It got one like. Woo! That one like is from our patron, Randy Carter. So, Walt, unfortunately, no points there. Mm. And then, Kim, you found the Fresh Prince of Despair at Fridge underscore underscore pants. 13 films to get to know me. Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Heat, Director's Definitive Edition. The Fast and the Furious. Too Fast, Too Furious. Fast and Furious, Tokyo Drift. Fast Five, Fast and Furious Six, Fur he skipped this movie, by the way. Fast and Furious Six, Furious Seven, The Fate of the Furious, F9, Fast Ten, Shrek Two, and Tangled. And we said we love Tangled and a lot of other those other films. Boy, do we have a podcast for you and no likes. So unfortunately, mm. no points. No points. All right, Walt, you said you have one. Please hit us with it, please, and thank you. It is just at famous birthdays today. Fast and Furious premiered on this day 15 years ago. Okay. How do we want to respond to famous birthdays? Uh, damn straight it did. Guess who's still talking about it? Episode after episode. These Landed guys. the plane. We got it. I handed it. There we go. Damn straight it did. Guess who's still talking about it? Episode after episode. Boy, do we have a podcast for you. Oh. I'm going to say instead of boy, do we birthday, do we have a podcast for you? This is the weirdest site in the world. It's all YouTubers and TikTokers that no one ever knows because it's all like 15 year olds like yanking their algorithm around. But you know. I am wondering if it's an SEO play that's going to die with the rise of AI, but that's a later problem. Kim, you emailed me one. Please share it with us. God. All right. This this is in response to uh, another tweet that says uh, <laughs> Dragon Ball Z's heroes learn to drive. And okay. it says, she's fast. She's furious. She's Dom Toretto's newest ally in an ongoing crisis that only drag racing and family can resolve. This fall, it's Fast and the Furious, the. <laughs> Ooh. Now, Kim, how do we want to respond to this? Uh, can't wait for two Z Fast, Z Furious. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> can't wait for Z Fast, Z Furious. Boy, do we have a podcast for you. Beautiful, perfect, flawless. Love it. Joe, please hit me with yours. Mine is a tweet from Hector J. Tabora on at Hector? what the heck Hector? Uh, what the heck underscore tour. Great name as well. Uh, he's replying to one take announcing that Justin Lin is being eyed to direct Spider Man four. Oh, I saw this one. That's good. Yeah. He says, this is why I hate Marvel movie fans. Comments shitting on Justin Lin when Fast and Furious 3 through 6 so sh show stronger technical merit from him than Watts has in three films. Not to mention Star Trek Beyond was fun, and this dude can really film action sequences. As, a gi as giant Justin Lin fans, we couldn't agree more, Hector. Boy, do we have a podcast for you. I found one... I don't know if I love or not. I also found while I was looking, Justin Lin's Perfect Storm Entertainment developing biopic on World Rally Vice Champion Michelle Mouton. So Justin Lin doing more car stuff. That'd be kind of cool, actually. Curious. So yeah. yeah. Mine is from Hood Internet, which is a DJ duo, but it's also just Steve Rydell 
and it's a picture of a thing that Joe, you might have, or we might have bought for Turbos for Tots, or people in the Discord have, but kids today don't want Tickle Me Elmo, or Beyblades, or Juju Pets. They want the Toretto house from Fast and Furious. Oh, and I have one at my house, yes. Nano scene Toretto house. And I'm going to say, no toy chest is complete <laughs> without the Toretto house. Boy, do we have a podcast for you. I love the Hood Internet, though. I haven't listened to them in a while, but great mashup DJs. So shout out to Steve Rydell and Hood Internet. But also shout out to Cam and Walt. Thank you once again for joining us for another go round of this fine fine podcast what would you like to plug only for the first time in like three appearances last time kim did you start plugging your own stuff do you want to keep that streak up or do you want to return to no plugging please take it away uh i can plug i have a story out i think last week about uh michael rubin the uh billionaire founder of fanatics and how he took over the trading card industry so if you're interested in Ooh. Uh, Trading cards, sports cards, all that stuff. Go check it out on Bloomberg.com and Bloomberg Business Week magazine. Sweet. Very, very cool. Kim just reports on everything that I think is cool at all times. That's his. That's actually in his contract. That's kind of my job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, does Joe think this? They like have like a secret spy in my house. So like, does Joe think this is cool? You should. Gen- you guys should just genuinely like brainstorm ideas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me some ideas. I'm always looking. <laughs> Okay, okay, if I have any stupid ideas, I will send them to you. Well, stupid fun, stupid fun. Fun. Not stupid. That, that sounds like a business we have for five or seven. <laughs> um, is this coming out this week or next? Remind this will me. be out on Tuesday in six days. In six days, okay. Um, well, then I probably can't reveal a thing that's launching, but I would say check my Twitter account for a thing that is launching uh, probably today, uh, if, if, if you are listening to this in your earballs first. Ooh. Uh, yeah, my Twitter account is at Waltiki. Uh, I have a very cool job now, and uh, something very, very fun is about to launch. So that is that is my plug. Uh, that is my enigmatic plug. Also, just buy my book. I, I've said it before. Just, just keep saying keep, buy my book. Buy my book. It's yes. called You Are What You Watch. Uh, it's available wherever books are sold. I was also looking for the thread where I email you guys to you know confirm the recordings or whatever, and I was just searching for Kim's last name. And I love seeing in Numlock News when – Something that Kim reports on gets, you know, finds its way into Unlock News. It's it's a nice oh, that's go round sweet. of just, you know, cross promotion. It's it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. I, I like my friend's stuff. He writes he writes some good stuff. Sometimes it's super cool. Good <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> still it's still a compliment. All right, mm-hmm. we're good. <laughs> Joe, our next episode, our three hundred and fiftieth on the main feed, is oh, the oh, Princess oh, Bride wow. from nineteen eighty seven. That's really good. That's wild. What's it gonna be? It's too many. Too we did us. We did a special episode for one hundred. We maybe did a special episode for two fifty. We might we not said, have. We said we said five hundred should be like the five hundred. Yeah, three fifty is just it's a nice round number, but it's not. But yeah, five hundred will be something in you know three years. But episode three fifty next week is the Princess Bride. But you guys will be back in three weeks to talk about Fast Five as this <laughs> franchise blows the lid off things and just gets crazy, crazy, crazy. But thank you once again for joining us. And for thank all things you. Too Fast Too Forever, go to cageclub.me, facebook.com slash Too Fast Too Forever, or at Too Fast Too Forever on all the platforms. Email us, family at cageclub.me. Check out our Patreon page at Too Fast Too Forever.com and our store at cageclub.me slash shop. And come back next week for The Princess Bride. Ooh. I'm Joey Lewandowski. I'm Joe Too. And that was Walt Hickey and Kim Bassine, And we will tell you all about it when we see you again. 